Hey, Gathering Place family, so good to be with you. Uh, right now, I wanted to share a little bit on my heart. There is a question that some people have been asking. Uh, are we meeting, meaning in person as the Gathering Place, as a church, are we meeting? As you know, here in Sacramento County, where our church is located, we have moved back into the purple tier. And what that means for churches is that you're not supposed to operate indoors, so only outdoors. And the same is true with gyms, with restaurants. They can do takeout or outside dining, bars. Uh, there are other industries that are affected by that as well. It's a hard season that we live in right now. It's a hard time, especially for these small business owners and all the employees affected and their families. It's not an easy season that we're walking through as a nation and just specifically as our community, which on a side note, I would say this, uh, make sure you are praying for those uh, affected in, in their jobs, those businesses that are being limited. Find out how you can help them, shop local, do whatever you can, and let's, let's make sure we help one another through the season. It's difficult for everyone. But for us, uh, my role as a pastor is to decide how do we uh, navigate the season that we're in. And let me just tell you something. There's no easy answer to it. We have to uh, care for our community. We have to think about those who we may never uh, directly interact with. We have to think about those in our congregation, those they interact with outside. And all of that has to be done in light of what Scripture says. And so when I go before the Lord to say, okay, God, what do we do? We're hearing from... Uh, the government that there's certain orders that are being given as far as what is allowed and what isn't allowed. How do I process that? Let me just share this with you. Uh, I recognize it's not easy and it doesn't satisfy everybody the answers that we come to. Uh, but for me, I feel like I have to go back to the Word of God. What does the scripture say? Because we have marching orders and our marching orders, they don't come from our government. They don't come from our denomination. They don't even come from me. Our marching orders come from the word of God. And so what is the word of the Lord saying to us? And then we have to think about how do we take that word and apply it to the context that we're in? So there are seasons when we have the scripture, but we need to adapt it to a certain context that might be different than yesterday's or tomorrow's. And so how do we fit it in to today? And let me just say this as well. Uh, pastors all over are having to navigate this, and we are coming to different conclusions for our own local context. Some are meeting in person. Some are meeting outdoors. Some are meeting online. Some are doing a hybrid. And uh, for all of those, you know, I applaud you. Do what you feel like the Lord is, is telling you to do in light of Scripture. And I'm supportive of you no matter what you would do. Whatever your church is, is deciding to do, pray for them if you're from outside the gathering place. But I want to look at some Scripture with you and walk you through it as far as why we are meeting. Why we are meeting. Spoiler alert, we are meeting. And we're meeting in person. And at this point during the fall and winter here that we're going into, we anticipate that we'll, we will be meeting indoors. And, uh, and there's a reason for this. There's a reason that we're, we're gathering together still, though we do have the capacity to go online, like you're watching right now. Uh, there's something significant about meeting together. And so we're going to read from one of the most common scriptures that people will use as far as a, an argument for why we should meet together, and that's from Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, you can look in your Bible there. I'm going to try to put it up on the, sc on the screen as well. Um, but before we get there, I want to say this to you. Uh, my reasoning for why we are meeting is not a protest. It is not taking a stand against government orders. It's not taking a stand for or against anything. It's really how we navigate uh, who we are as a church, what we do and why we do it. And so when, when the government gives orders or directives that would tell us how to meet or how often or whatever, we, we consider those things, but those are not final for us. And so even though there is a... Um, there is an authority that they have as governing bodies. We also have a higher authority that we answer to as the church. And so what we have to do is go to that first. 
And this is where we find ourselves in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 is where we'll start. But I want to actually back up a little bit. In Hebrews 10, verse 25, it tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, uh, but exhort one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So when this was written to the re original uh, you know, congregation there, uh, he's saying we need to not stop meeting like some people have just fallen off for whatever reason. And they had their own reasons back then. We could say, oh, they got tired, they you know, got distracted or whatever. They had their own pressures. Every generation has its own pressures. And so for us today, we have our pressures as well that would cause us to stop meeting. But the scripture is saying, don't stop meeting. In fact, encourage one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And I think that's interesting because he says uh, the day is approaching. The day of what? The day of the Lord, the day of the return of Christ. Some people would say, well, that's been happening for a long time. How, how much longer until it, it, Jesus comes back? It might not even happen in our generation. Well, I don't know if this is the final generation for everybody, but I know this is my final generation and it's your final generation. And so whether the day approaches and meets us or we meet it, uh, so much the more there's an urgency that we would gather together to encourage one another. But I want to say this, that the reason why we are meeting is not, again, it's not to defy the government. It's not to stick it to the man. I know some of you, you're listening, you love to stick it to the man. I like to stick it to the man, except for when I am the man, then I don't want anyone to stick it to me. Here's something else that's interesting. The man likes to stick it to the man. It doesn't, he just doesn't like it when people stick it to him. Well, we see that with our government giving orders and directives that they can't even carry themselves. Jesus addressed this with the Pharisees. He said, you lay burdens on others and you can't even carry these burdens. We know this is the reality and this is why they keep getting called out. But let me say this, this is not about politics and it's not about what the government is saying we can or cannot do. It's not about their honesty or hypocrisy. That is all secondary to why we at the gathering place are meeting. So what I want to do with you is back up a little bit because we can use the scripture to say we should meet because the scripture says we should meet. Well, great, but why are you meeting? Is it simply to protest? Let me tell you something. At the gathering place, we're not protesting. This is not a protest. This is uh, done irregardless of what is the directive or the order that's coming our way. We are doing this because we have to navigate in the scripture and uh, maintain a sense of honor and integrity before the Lord. And so in Hebrews chapter 10, why don't you just look back a little bit with me? So we got to 25 and it says, don't forsake the assembling of yourself together. But I want to back up in that verse because in, in verse 19, it says this, and this is, it tells us why we're not to forsake the assembling. In fact, it tells us what do we do when we assemble together? Verse 19, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. Let me pause for a second. The author has spent all these chapters saying that the presence of God is available to the people of God. And he says that this veil has been torn. This veil was his flesh. Now, when he said this, all of his original readers would understand that in the temple, there were different areas of the temple when different people could approach to a certain degree. But as you would go from the outer courts into what's called the holy place, there was a veil that separated the holy place from the holiest of all or the most holy. And behind that veil was where the manifest presence of God was. And there, that was a place that the high priest could only go once a year. And so it's a holy place, the presence of God, the manifest presence of God was uh, inaccessible to the people of God and the veil is the border there. Now what the scripture told us happened when Jesus was crucified, that physical veil in the temple was torn in half, but it was torn from the top to the bottom. And so the supernaturally, it's as though the Lord from the top ripped open the veil and he made his presence accessible to the people. That happens simultaneously when Jesus' body was torn open. His body 
uh, by giving his life, it made the presence of God accessible to his people. And so the scripture is saying God's presence is accessible to you and me. But he goes on and he says this, And having a high priest over the house of God, let us, by the way, we're going to get into three lettuces. These aren't the vegetables. This is us. Let us, let you and me, not just you, not just me, not just us privately or individually, but let us collectively as a body, as a community with one another, let us, there's three of them that are going to come up here. Let us draw near with a heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Very first reason that we gather together is that we would draw near to God. We need to gather together so that we together can draw near to God, that we can go before God with a clean conscience, that we can go to God to be refreshed in his presence. You know, there are so many people right now that are struggling with the weight of the world on them. And as they're continuing to isolate, this weight gets heavier and heavier. And all these thoughts and many people get stuck in some bad uh, habits and patterns in their life right now. And so there is something significant about coming together all the more right now. And so we can experience this refreshing that comes from the Lord. Now, for the gathering place, I want to tell you this. My wife and I, over the past several years, we received something from the Lord where he said our house, our home, would be a gathering place for times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. When we were called to pastor the Gathering Place Church, we were excited because we believed that that was significant. And the Lord was saying that this church, this place, as we gather together, we are gathering for times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. And so why are we meeting? We are meeting so that we could draw near to the Lord together and be refreshed in his presence. And I don't know about you. I need to be refreshed. In fact, I do know about you, and I know about your neighbor, and I know about your friends. We all need to be refreshed right now. There is so much that is coming our way that is discouraging and wants to suck the life out of us. Suicide rates are, are through the roof. Alcoholism, drug use, the recidivism, back to those things. Uh, it's terrible, and people don't need to be stuck in that situation. This is why we need to come together. Let us draw near together. And you notice that he says, let's do it boldly. We come to God not crawling on our hands and knees, but we do it boldly because he, he has made the way. He's already paved the way. It's not you or me and our goodness that gets us there. It's the blood of Jesus. So the number one reason why we are meeting, we are meeting to worship. We're meeting to draw near to God. And we're doing that together. Second thing is this, verse 23 let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Did you catch that right there? Not only do we draw near to God, but when we come together, it reminds us of this hope that we have. And it reminds us not to begin to speak those words of doubt and despair, to mimic and mock and, and uh, regurgitate what we're hearing through the news. We are to hold fast the confession of our hope because he who made the promises is faithful. Right now, we are hearing about potentials for food shortages, toilet paper shortages, ammunition shortages, civil war, all of the laws that are going to be implemented or turned over or turned back that maybe we don't want. We're hearing about a dark winter, a second, a third, a fourth wave of the coronavirus pandemic surging. We're hearing about lockdowns. We're hearing about uh, the potential for riots. We're hearing about those who are trying to take advantage of the season of transition with our government. And there's so much that's unsure. There's so many reasons to doubt the future. When you listen to the news, to the media, to the radio, to your neighbors and coworkers, that's not us. And that's not the speech that should be coming out of our mouth. But I'll tell you something. 
what I have found is that the less we get together and the less we remind ourselves and are reminded about this hope we have, the more likely we are to begin speaking or confessing those other things. And so the scripture is telling us that when we gather together, it reminds us to hold on to this confession of hope that we have because the one who made these promises is faithful. What am I saying? The promises of God for you are good, of health, of life, of abundance, of fruitfulness, of joy, of peace, of goodness, of provision, of strength, of health, of a future, of hope. All of these things are promises from God. And the scripture is telling us, and he is faithful. And when you come together to worship God together and with one another, you are reminded of that and something changes on the inside of you. And then we go out and we don't go out with doom and gloom. We go out with groom and bloom. I'm going to write a book about it someday or maybe an article with that title. Or maybe I'll just make a meme. Instead of doom and gloom, it's groom and bloom. What am I saying? You start to groom this on the inside. You start to water that grass. It turns green, right? You, you start to sow in the right things. It bears the fruit that you would desire. These are the words that we're to speak. Words of life. Words of, of future, of a hope. Because that's what God sees for you. It doesn't mean there's no storm around us. What it means is that storm will not wipe you out. It will not shake you. And so that's our confession. It doesn't matter how hard things are in the world that we live in. God is on our side. And and for those around us, he wants to be on their side as well. And we speak those words and bring that life to people and it changes things. So that's the second reason why we are meeting First is so we can draw near to God. Second is so that we can be built up in our faith and hope and lay hold of those words and not back down from it. The third thing here, he says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Let's consider how we can stir up one another to love and good works. The world that we live in right now needs people uh, to show the love of God. They need compassion. They need mercy. They They need forgiveness. They need help. And so... Uh, it would be great if everyone just figured out how to help their neighbor on their own. But the scripture is saying, we've got to think about how we can not just for ourselves do the right thing and live out our calling, but how can you help this other person from our church, from, from our congregation, how can you stir them up to love and to fulfill the call of God, the plan of God on their lives? And so as a church, When we come together, we need to be able to pray with one another. We need to talk with one another. We need to to then discuss, hey, how can we make a difference in our community in this time? What can we do for our neighborhood? What can we do for that struggling small business that, you know, maybe that nail salon where where we would always go and get our nails done? Not me, maybe maybe you, uh, your barber or whatever. What can we do to help them out at this time? So these are the types of things that, that happen in person. They don't happen online. I thank God for the ability to come into people's homes via video, online, come into their phones, but it's not the same. Shake your head if you think it's not the same. It's not the same. There's something powerful about letting us come together, you and me and others at the same time in the same place. Let us come together and let's stir one another up, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves. So we do those three things when we're not forsaking the assembling of ourselves. So why, that's why we're meeting. We're meeting to worship. We're meeting to be built up in our faith and our hope. We're, we're meeting so that we can encourage one another. Now, I want to I say a little bit more to really bring out a scriptural perspective of why we are meeting, because uh, there are a number of, of scriptures that would speak to this. For example, I said this, this is not a stand against the order or the the directive from the governor or the CDC. Um, It's not a stand for or against the government. I don't believe that we we are at a place where we are having to take a stand against the government. Not at this point. We are simply taking taking the scripture and saying, we're just going to do what that says. 
We're going to do what that says. There are examples in the Bible where they had to take a stand against the government. Remember Moses and Pharaoh, children of Israel, were in bondage there to, to the Egyptians. And God said to Moses, go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go that they may serve me or, or worship me. So seven of the ten plagues that, that God brought on Pharaoh, per, um, what preceded those with, was God saying through Moses, let them go that they might worship me. And Pharaoh said no. And so the more he did that, the more his heart was hardened, the more God um, didn't just take him out in the knockout punch, but he put him up against the ropes. And he said, okay, Pharaoh, you want to play this game? I'll play this game with you. But at the end of it, I want you to know, and this is found in Exodus chapter 9, verse 16, this is the purpose that I've raised you up. So all the world will see my glory. And they're going to see my glory when you, the, the, uh, the sovereign ruler over all the known land here, when you take such a hard stand against me, they're going to find out that you are only a man and I am God. And, and all the nations surrounding, not just the Egyptians, all the nations are going to see what God would do. And this was in fulfillment to God's word to Abraham when he made covenant with Abraham and ultimately all of Israel when he said, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. And so Pharaoh had cursed God's people so that God was obligated to his word to say, now I will curse the Egyptians. And as a result of that, they were destroyed and through the plagues and through the death of the firstborn and then his armies as well. But Moses had to take a stand. God's people had to take a stand against Pharaoh. I don't believe that's where we're at right now. Uh, in fact, I think we're more along the lines of 1 Timothy chapter 2 when it talks to us about praying. And, it's a, and Paul is telling Timothy this. He's giving instruction to the believers, and he walks them through their process for dealing with government. In this situation, he says, Therefore, I exhort that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Uh, he goes on to say some very important things, but this is our, our, our call when it comes to the government, is that we would pray for them. We would pray um, for the, them to lead with um, humility and wisdom and that God would surround them with, with godly counsel and wisdom because the decisions they make affect our lives. And we want to be able to, to live our lives quiet and peaceful. We want to be able to worship freely. We want to be able to walk down the street and feel safe. We want to be able to interact with the government and not feel like they're taking advantage of us. All of those things are God's desire. And he said, pray for these things to happen. And so that is, that is our, our normal stance towards our government. We're always praying for them, and we're thankful for them, even those we didn't vote for. We speak words of life over them because we want them uh, just in the same manner that our hearts were changed, theirs can be too. And so we want righteous men and women serving. And if they're not, well, we still want them to make decisions that are in the best interest of God's people as well. So we should pray for our leaders that, so that we can live this life that um, really enables us to worship God freely and at peace. But there are other times, even in the New Testament, when decisions had to be made to go against government orders. And you see this, for example, in Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, uh, there's a common verse that is, you'll hear it quoted right now, when Peter said to the authorities, he said, we ought to obey God rather than men. That's in verse 20, um, 29. We ought to obey God rather than men. And I think that all of us would say, yeah, that, that's true. We should obey God rather than men. There are times when uh, there is conflict, even with our, our governing you know, authorities. And so they're telling us that we must do something or must not do something that is in direct conflict with what God is saying. And so we have to choose at that point to follow God. And I think all of us watching and listening right now would agree with that. Isn't that true? Shake your head. Yeah, that's true. I can't see you, but that's true. I believe you said so. But let me give you a little context to that. Um, because when we make a decision to follow God instead of man, it would be great if 
the end of the story was, and everything turned out so awesome. People just said, okay, and God showed up, and, and everyone was had a great time, and it was fun, and we just saw the favor and, and no opposition. Even uh, though that sounds good, that's not what happens all, all the time. It does happen sometimes, but not all the time. In fact, in the scripture, in the context of Acts chapter 5, the disciples, they had been going around, and they were preaching, and... Um, then they got arrested. They got arrested because they were told you shouldn't be gathering together and preaching. Why were they told not to? Well, the governing authorities were afraid that if everyone came together and began to believe this, then the government would lose control of the people. They, and if they lost control, then they would lose their positions of power. They would lose their influence. They would lose the ability to dominate and, and receive you know, the taxes, everything else. And so... They, they thought that these people were going to overturn the government because suddenly they believe it, that Jesus is their Savior, their Messiah, that he died and he rose from the dead. And so they commanded the disciples, the apostles, they said, stop preaching this. But the apostles kept preaching. So they arrested them again and they threw them in prison. They threw them in jail as a result. And then uh, supernaturally they were let out. And when they got arrested again because they were let out and they kept preaching. They kept having church in their experience and understanding of it. They got arrested again. And um, <laughs> you got to look back here because I think it's so interesting. Uh, when, they, when they were arrested, and let, let me look here in Acts chapter 5 with you. It's, it says this, verse 28, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. What are they saying right there? The, the, the ruling authorities were saying, you're going around and you're telling people what really happened. And when people find out, they're going to blame us. You know why they're afraid of that? Because it was true. They were at fault. I know the Romans uh, actually physically crucified Jesus, but it was these Jewish leaders who turned the crowd against Jesus to get him crucified. They stirred up the Romans to crucify him. So they were afraid of being exposed. Uh, this is how you know the, the nature of, of um, corrupt government works. When, when government gets corrupt, in fact, leadership at all. In fact, this is you, you and I, if we're doing something wrong behind the scenes, we don't want to be found out. And that's what's happening there. They're saying we don't want to be found out because it'll turn the people against us. And so they, they were telling him, you can't, you can't preach anymore. This is where Peter said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Now, again, it would be great if then they just had a glorious experience from there. But that's not exactly how it worked. Look at the consequences of this. In verse 33, it says, when they, the leaders, when they heard this, they were furious and they plotted to kill them. They plotted to kill the, the apostles because they took a stand and said, we're not going to follow your directives or your orders here. Um, and they didn't do it disrespectfully or dishonorably. They just said, we, we have to. We have to do what God is telling us to do. Second thing is, when you get down to verse 40, after they had discussion, it says, they called for the apostles and and they beat, beat them, and they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and then they let them go. See, this is where doing the right thing has consequences that sometimes are negative. And the apostles here, what happened? They got arrested, they got threatened, they got thrown in jail, and now they're getting beaten. You know what the progression goes to next? Then they start losing their lives. This is the normal process when you give the, you know, when the government takes an inch, they want to take a mile, meaning this. At first, they just said, stop. And then they said, we're going to fine you. And then they said, we're going to throw you in prison. And then they beat them. And then they killed them. That was their process there. So look what happens, though. These guys get beat up. That's the negative consequence. Verse 41 so they departed the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. They were rejoicing, not just that because they were beaten, but they suffered shame for his name. Not, not just uh, the bruises, 
but the shame that was heaped on them from other people who wouldn't understand why they would put themselves at risk to preach the word even though it cost them dearly. So you could imagine not only did those governing authorities uh, shame them for doing what they were doing because they were going to cause a problem for the whole community if they kept doing what they were doing, but yet can you imagine their neighbors, their friends, their families who didn't understand the command or the call of God, they didn't understand their relationship with God or the transformation that had taken place, they would have shamed these apostles for doing what the government said, don't do. They were shaming them. And these apostles, these followers of Jesus, rejoiced because they were even counted worthy by God to be shamed by others. What do I mean? They could have backed down and just said, you know what, we're not going to do anything. We're going to play it safe here. And uh, they, they had that ability to do it like so many others. And they would have been applauded. They would have been unnoticed. They would have missed out on what God is telling them to do. Here's what happens. There was cost to them physically. There was cost to them emotionally. Um, relationally, there was cost to them. But here is the real reward in verse 42. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. They were emboldened in their faith. And though they had been shamed and beaten, they, they went after it even more. And as a result, in verse 1 of chapter 6, it says, Now in those days, the number of disciples was multiplying. Why were people being transformed by Jesus uh, at an exponential rate? Why is that? Because there were a group of apostles and disciples and followers of Jesus who said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And they did. And so as they did that, revival continued to expand, not without cost, not without risk, but they did it and God showed up. So let me say this to you. There are those negative consequences of gathering together and continuing to do what God is telling us to do. But there's also very positive and life-giving uh, consequences as well. When I think about uh, people who are isolated for so long and the pain they're going through, when I think about what's happening in their hearts and relationally, um, for me, I go back to the word, God, how do we respond to this? And we go back and we say, let's gather together. I want to say this. We are not gathering together because it's our right as Americans. I believe we should take advantage of our rights. Uh, but we don't gather together because it's our right. We gather together because it is right. Do you understand the difference there? Your spiritual and emotional health is essential. And to develop that, that is essential. So regardless of whether it's deemed essential or our right here, we have to go back to, okay, but, but what, is, what is God saying? And what is the bigger picture for this? Now, I want to say this. Um, the reason why I say it's not about rights is when we make decisions like this, for example, if this was all legal and approved and everything was allowed and it was just up to us to make the decision, what would you do? See, this is what you have to wrestle through because then you're going to Scripture. What would you do based on your understanding of Scripture? Uh, well, I, I'll tell you this. If the government said, look, this is the situation we're in, but you choose what you're going to do, we're not going to put the restriction on you, what would we do? We would gather together, and we would say, for those who can meet, if you're healthy, you're feeling good, um, We'll put on a mask. We will take the, net, the precautions to distance, to wash our hands, to try to honor one another with physical contact, so on and so forth when we're indoors. But we're going to meet together because the risk of not meeting for those especially who are healthy is greater than the risk of meeting to us. We understand we're not just physical, but we are spiritual and we are, we are emotional or our soul, spirit, soul, and body. And we need to be ministered to across the board. Um, if somebody is not feeling well, if somebody's at risk, is, if somebody um, lives with or interacts with those at risk quite often, I would tell you, in light of your situation, 
it would be, uh, it's perfectly okay to not gather in person. In fact, even before the coronavirus pandemic, if somebody had a compromised immune system or lived with someone who did, I would tell them it's perfectly okay and not wise to be out in, in large gatherings anyways. And so you've got to navigate as a responsible adult for yourself. Um, and before the Lord, what do I do? So we ask these questions. If it was totally legal, what would we do? Well, we would, we would be meeting anyways, okay? Because that's what we see from the scripture and how we're interpreting it in our context. I also ask the question, does this decision travel? Meaning this, uh, in other states, other countries, they have different rules and regulations. Does it travel in other experiences? So for example, in, um, in a politically oppressive situation, maybe a socialist or, or a communist country where you are restricted from declaring and preaching Jesus freely or meeting freely and, and, and having these gatherings, does our decision to gather translate to that? Maybe in times of war or unrest or, or some other um, ma major event. Does our decision travel? And I would tell you it does. For example, maybe if you lived in communist China where the, you can't freely gather, or maybe some places in the Middle East or India, you can't just freely gather in the, to the same degree you can in the United States. As a believer, what would you do? Well, you would find ways to gather. And so it's an underground church. You meet in houses. You meet coffee shops. You meet in dark alleys. You do what it takes to gather because there's a greater directive or order and that comes from God and it's for our well-being and the risk of being found out and put in jail or losing your business uh, that's not nearly as great as the risk of living a life outside of the will of God and so whether that means just missing out on on the life God's given you here but also there are people whose eternity is at stake and, and so we've got to be able to gather and preach the truth, bring the word to them. And so we ask ourselves, uh, would we gather if we're, we're in a different state, different country, different time? Yeah, we would. We would. And uh, we're, we are perfectly willing to accommodate, make adjustments as much as possible. We're not, again, it's not a protest and it's not taking a stand against or taking a stand for. In our context, this is the decision that we're having to make. Now, I'm saying all of that to let you know we are meeting. We are meeting in person. For now, we're meeting indoors because that's the best setup we have, especially in the winter season that we're coming into. Um, and we're, we plan to continue meeting for, uh, well, you know, 2020. It's hard to make plans for tomorrow the way things have worked, but plan on being here next Sunday and the Sunday after that. And we don't intend to stop meeting. Let me tell you this, though. If, again, you are experiencing any symptoms or you have concerns about being around groups or you know you have somebody that you can't risk the potential for carrying something though you might not be uh, affected and they would there is no pressure on you there is no shame there is no expectation that you would come in person we love you i want to hear from you and not and i'm not going to say you don't have enough faith or you're not bold enough or anything. That's a bunch of baloney. I'm gonna, I wanna hear from you so I can say, well, what can we do? Can I come and, and sit on your porch? Can, you know, can I change the way we address the online messages? Can we you know, come alongside and just pray with you? Can I call you on the phone? Uh, our heart and desire is to engage everybody and do the best we can. And so for those who can meet, let's meet. For those who, who can't, aren't ready, or, or whatever your concern is, uh, don't give up and don't quit and don't go somewhere else. Know this, you have a place with us, even if you're not here physically right now. And we want to open our hearts to you and, and continue to partner through this season with you no matter what. So that's what we are doing. We are gathering. We're gathering together and we're gathering to worship God. We're gathering to be restored and refreshed in our souls and our joy and our hope to be built back up. And we're gathering so that we can provoke one another to live out the plan of God in our lives. This is what I asked our congregation to do today. I'm going to ask you the same thing if you're, uh, as you watch online. One by one, how do, we, how do we do what God's told us to do to see these disciples, uh, other followers of Jesus, you know, really embrace who, who he is? 
Uh, we do it one by one. So I'm asking you, if you know somebody from our church, um, I want you to, to begin to pray for them personally, but partner with them, like encourage one another. Send them a text weekly. Let them know that, that you're, you love them, that you're praying for them, and uh, just speak life into them. So find a partner. Partner up like that just with at least one other person. Second thing is find somebody outside of our church, maybe outside of any church, whether they're disconnected from a church, don't know Jesus yet, maybe they're even of another religion, whatever it is. I want to ask you, start to connect with that person. Love them, serve them, speak life to them, encourage them in the season that we're in, and pray for them. You don't even have to let them know that you're praying for them yet or that you're, you're you know, wanting to share Jesus with them. Just start to build that relationship with them, and let's see what God can do. So that's a very long answer to the question of, are you meeting? Yes, we are meeting on Sunday mornings at 9.30 a.m. on campus, in person, inside. We are asking people to wear masks. As long as their feet are moving, you, you should have a mask on. And uh, our church has done great about that and, and loving and respecting one another as a result of it. Um, and, th- and we are meeting, um, we're meeting in person. We are, we are worshiping. We are encouraging each other. And we're going to see God do what he wants to do. And so I would love to invite you to be part of that. Um, but if you are on the other side and you can't, again, I want to tell you this. I, I still want to be able to serve you and pastor you and connect you with others and see you grow during this season because none of it is taking God by surprise. And he has very real things he wants to do in your life. And so please understand our heart. We are not being cavalier about this or dismissive. Uh, if the government said, hey, you can do whatever you want tomorrow, well, praise the Lord. If they say, hey, you can't do anything tomorrow, well, praise the Lord. We're going to obey God rather than men and without an attitude. And without, you know, I'm not trying to by any means, and I know I've said this before, but I'm concerned with the response of Christians towards government to where we are so ready to fight and complain and criticize and argue and make it about the government as opposed to what is Christ doing on the inside of us? I heard somebody say, you know, we fight to put Christ back in Christmas. The reality is we need Christ back in Christians. And so this is what it's about. The government, that, that's a side dish. The rules and the laws of the land, those are side dishes to us. We honor them, we consider them, as long as they align up with what God's word says. And when they disagree, we're put in a place where we have to choose. And so as long as the authority is for our good and not for our evil, then they're within their authority. But when they start to uh, rebel against God or give orders or directives that would be contrary to what God says, like what Pharaoh did, then for us, we have to say, you know, we're going to go ahead and worship God. We're going to do what he says. So we will uh, respectfully disagree and you won't hear me talking bad about the government uh, or the policies or anything else. I want to really just say what God's word is saying to us. I believe that's where our hope is. That's where life is found. So you can share this with anybody you want and invite people. We will be here again Sunday morning, 930. We love you, Gathering Place family. See you next time.